Hello everybody, I'm Raphael Perry and it's time for some more Fighting Fantasy Classics. This time we're diving right back into Island of the Lizard King and I think I've come to a bit of a decision, right? Because last time, reading all the options at the beginning, it took a bit of time and ate into the episode length. So I think after the first couple of books, most of us are going to be quite familiar with the Fighting Fantasy rules, so I might skip over that portion, but I'll still obviously do the adventure background before diving into section one. Now, a couple of other things I wanted to cover. Let's talk about Mungo, right? I remember, as I mentioned last time, I remember the first time I played this being absolutely gutted when Mungo died. But did I cheat? Did I go back and take the other direction along the beach to try and save him? No, I didn't. I was fully motivated, I was fully invested in Mungo's story of the Lizard Man, of the Lizard King sending his evil Lizard Man soldiers to abduct villagers, and I wanted to get revenge on Mungo, right? This is part of accepting the adventure. It's the way old school game books used to be, you, you were kind of like in it for the long haul, you know, and, and consequences mattered, damn it. Because they were the consequences of your decisions, right? Incidentally though, if you do go the other direction, Mungo still dies to the giant crab. You just don't get the picture. Actually, you might still get to see the picture, if it, depending on how it directs you to it, but yeah. Um, but it's one of the reasons Mungo dies though is that he has already served his purpose. Now, it's not like saying, you know, he, he serves two purposes, right? Firstly, he gives us a human side to the story, he draws us in, he makes us really invested and really want to carry on and be like, yeah, this is our old pal Mungo, you know, we're going off on an adventure again for the first time in ages, this will be brilliant. And then, tragically, Mungo's part of the adventure is cut short by a, the pincers of a ginormous crab. But, he's not finished. Because now, he gives us that urge, that drive to continue, to carry on, and finish the deed. This one's for you, Mungo. Don't let it be forgotten. In fact, I'll probably end the description of every episode of this adventure with this one's for Mungo. <laughs> right! So, when last we left it, we had buried Mungo's body on the beach, shoved his sword in the sand, and set off to the stone hut, which is probably kind of empty. Oh! The abandoned hut is littered with broken furniture, smashed pottery, and a few bits of torn clothing. You kick away a dirty rug and see the handle of a trapdoor in the floorboards. Ah, uh, we will absolutely look and see what's down there. You pull on the handle and lift up the trapdoor. In a small compartment, you see a wooden box which you lift out and place on the floor. The lid is covered with candle wax. So, I can presume someone's been lighting candles and sticking them on top of the box. Or just dripping candle wax on it. That's a bit odd. But let's look inside. I imagine someone has crept down and opened up their secret, you know, their, their not-so-secret trapdoor and under the candle light late at night peered at the contents of this box, fumbled with the opening mechanism. So let's do just that. The lid lifts up easily and inside you find a corked earthenware jug. Oh, it's quite a big box then. And a note which reads, Many years ago I came to Fire Island for peace and solitude. But since the lizard men have dwelt here, such an existence is no longer possible. I have now returned to the mainland. Many of the plants and bushes here are poisonous. A scratch can kill you. Drink my potion from this jug and you will come to no harm. I wish you well for whatever reason you are here. Farewell, Baskin. We can drink the liquid or just leave it behind and go. Let's drink it. I mean, this is a ridiculously convoluted trap to set up. The liquid tastes of aniseed and is milky in colour. You gulp it down but feel no effects and can only presume that it will protect you on the journey ahead. You put down the jug and leave the hut. 
And if we check our carrot sheet here, Garius has drank the aniseed liquid. And we may be asked about that in the future. Behind the hut, you see a narrow goat track leading up the side of the cliff. You wend your way up it and are quite exhausted by the time you reach the top. You take a swig of water from your flask and realize that water shortage could be a problem for you on this island. Looking west, you see the daunting sight of the sleeping volcano standing among the trees, but no sign of life, although you can certainly hear it, a cacophony of bird and insect noise. With the light quickly fading, you decide to climb up the night. So, sorry, you decide to camp for the night behind some rocks. You do not sleep very well and are awake at first light, eager to set off. You decide to head directly into the trees. Now, something else I wanted to mention actually is that there are quite a few Lizard Man themed adventures in the Fighting Fantasy series. Obviously, there's Island of the Lizard King. There's Portal of Evil with all the dinosaurs. That's got some Lizard Men in it. There's Battleblade Warrior with the Siege of the Vimorna. There's lots of Lizard Men. There's a whole army of Lizard Men besieging the city of Vimorna, and you're, you're actually playing the Prince of the City, going off on a quest to find a mag uh, magic sword of Telak or something to... Uh, is it Telak, the god of... Uh, the lion god? I can't remember. Um, but it, that, sounds, that one's really nice, but it has a... that's one of those almost one true path books where there's only so many options you can take that are correct. And there's a lot of auto kills in that one. Um, one thing that ties those all together is they're all illustrated by the same artist. Which is probably why I think the dinosaur one's got a load of lizard men in it. Okay. The undergrowth between the trees is dense. Plants with long or broad leaves. Some with spiny tips. Vines, creepers, fungi, roots and flowers of all sizes, shapes and colours. Fighting for light and space in the humid jungle thicket. You have to use your sword to cut your way through it. And it is long and slow business. You can sit down and rest at the base of a giant great tree or continue hacking away so far. I think this is a trap. I think some kind of vine comes down and grabs me, or some kind of like um, Venus flytrap thing on the end, of, end, end and the end of a vine comes down and grabs me. I'm not going to rest here, I'm going to push on. That was me thinking I barely remembered this one. <laughs> Okay. As you push your way slowly through the undergrowth, the hairs on the back of your neck start to prickle, and you feel that you are being watched. You stand back, sword ready, watching the leaves for any sign of movement. Then, three large men with sharpened teeth step into view, each wearing only a crude loincloth. They are armed with stone clubs and long spears, but you are more alarmed to see that each wears a belt of shrunken human heads. The headhunters start to argue about who should kill you and earn the right to wear your head on his belt. Finally, one steps forwards. You must fight. And I remember the battle loot music was rather loud. Hopefully it won't be too overpowering. Fight! The first headhunter! Kill him with damage! Too damn right. Oh, this could be it. This should be it. Yeah! You have defeated the first headhunter. Now you must face the second headhunter. Oh dear, good. Now it's going to be one at a time again, isn't it? Okay. Yeah! Twelve in your face, headhunter. No coming back from that. I got one diff. That's uh, a difference of one in my favour. Uh-oh. Ooh! Ha ha ha! Ah! And there was I thinking our medium to low skill would be a hindrance. Okay. We can almost do this. I was going to say we can do this when I saw the results. Ha 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 ha! 
Oh, blimey, that's very low stamina. Uh, luck it. Oh, bugger! Ah! Okay. Ah! Wow! <laughs> oh, no! Is our adventure going to be cut short so soon already? Oh, dear. Oh! Luck! Luck, luck! We can't... Oh, overcome! Ah! Ah! You are dead. You have succumbed to the perils of Fire Island, the domain of the Lizard King. Well, that's a real shame. That is. You know, that was such a short excursion. We may very well return to Island of the Lizard King in the near future. But which book should we delve into next? All right. Warlock of Firetop Mountain and Death Trap Dungeon are both going to be very popular choices. Bloodbones is the latest, and it's book 61. Uh, book 60 ended up being Howl of the Werewolf, didn't it? Also, Bloodbones doesn't have the noun of adjective title that so many of the Fighting Fantasy <laughs> series are renowned for. The Warlock of Firetop Mountain. The Citadel of Chaos, the Forest of Doom, City of Thieves. Uh, it was very much, I used to call them of titles, because they always had the word of in the middle. Almost always. Rings of Kefir, hey, you know what? Um, yeah, maybe, because they did some science fiction ones as well. I never did finish Rings of Kefir, and then they did the, um, the superhero one. Oh, that was quite hilarious, actually, yeah. So... It's, it would be a shame to cut short the episode right now, so let's, uh... I mean, I've only been recording about ten minutes. Okay. If I do Warlock of Firetop Mountain or Death Trap Dungeon, I'm playing as Dekion Strom. If I do Sister of Chaos, who do I want to be? So I'm going to look at changing the hero. Okay, so that is... Oh, who's he? I can't remember. That's Elion Garak. Garak. Can't remember her. Or him. Her... I mean, these are portraits that the developers have all used in their Fighting Fantasy 3D adaptation. I uh, don't remember her. Uh, Hoodman. Hooded Man. Actually, the Hooded Man would be great for City of Thieves. A skulking knave. Got a fellow here with a scar. A woman with a rather extreme hairstyle. Actually, it could be a man. It's kind of hard to tell from just here, but the facial proportions and overall shape give a slightly feminine impression. Okay, we've got a bloke there with a big grin on his face. Got this fella. Ooh, a nice hood person with a mean look on their face. Good old Decky on Strom. Don't know her, but she's one of their new ones. Uh, oh, I remember. Yeah. Uh, is that supposed to be the elf from the Advanced Fighting Fantasy series? It doesn't look much like her. Oh, you got this woman here. Is, is that a headscarf or just a hair tucked back there? It could be a headscarf over it. Kind of hard to tell. Ah, this is based on the old monk from the Warlock of Firetop Mountain board game. The Rhino Man, 23. Uh, woman with a hat and a ponytail. Uh, this fella. Oh, is that, is that based on Lin Liren? That would be interesting if it was. So I think, out of all these, maybe Hood Man for City of Thieves, or... Decky on Strom. Oh, it's got to be done. However, if we do play as Decion Strom, then we're going to be playing one of the more famous entries in the series. Hmm. Okay. 
I'm tempted to go Citadel of Chaos. Um, or City of Thieves. Well, Hoodman was impressive. We call him Skerin. Yeah, Skerin the Hood. Skerin the Hood Man. And here we have City of Thieves. Alright. I did say I'd be skipping over the basics due to excess familiarity. I'm going to go Hardcore Hero just because I can. And uh, we'll roll stamina first. A 19. Kind of average. Not going to complain. Skill. Eight because it's lower. I need to get used to having two less skill. And oh, lucky Skerin is a lucky bugger. Okay, uh, potion. What do we have? We have a uh, skill of eight, so luck eleven. I'm kind of inclined to go with the luck, to be honest, this time. All right. And off we go. So these are the illustrations for this one. Was was it Ian Sibic or or um, no 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 no. Ah, oh, I know this one. It's uh, what's his name? Uh, because I'm thinking John Sibic did most of the artwork for the advanced fighting fantasy stuff. But this stuff, this was, this is great stuff. Uh, this guy did most of the fighting fantasy, more famous illustrations, and I can't remember his name. I know why I can't remember his name. It's because of something that's messing with my memory. Because I always thought he was Scottish because he had a Scottish surname, and I I met him at a convention recently, and he he was American. He was an American with a Scottish surname who went and studied in Scotland, and um, he did a load of concept art for. All of the Star Wars prequels and stuff like that. Oh, it, it it's going to bug me for ages now. I'll, I'll go look it up later. Or I'll look it up now. Later. You're an adventurer in the world of monsters and magic, living by quickness of wit and skill of sword. You earn your gold as a hired warrior, usually in the employ of rich nobles and barons on missions too dangerous or difficult for their own people. Slaying monsters and fearsome beasts in pursuit of some fabled treasure comes as a second nature to you. Being an experienced and highly trained in the art of the sword, being an experienced... Being an experienced warrior and highly trained in the art of the sword, you allow nothing to stand in your way on your quests. Your success on a mission is always assured, and your reputation has spread throughout the lands. Whenever you enter a village or town, the news of your arrival spreads through the citizens like wildfire. Few of them have ever met a dragon slayer before. So we've been built up to be this magnificent hero, and now we're going to Port Black Sand where it's really down and dirty and gritty and grim. One evening, after a long walk through the Outlands, you arrive at Silverton, a town which lies at the crossroads of the main trading routes in these parts. Great wooden wagons, hauled by teams of oxen, are often seen rumbling slowly through the town, laden with herbs, spices, silks, metalware, and exotic foods from far-off lands. Over the years, Silverton has prospered as a result of the rich merchants and traders stopping there en route to distant markets. Bugger, that's a long sentence for someone to say with my degree of asthma. Its wealth is quite apparent, with ornate buildings and richly dressed people aplenty. But as you enter the town gates, something strikes you as being not quite right. The people look nervous and on edge. Then you notice that all the windows in the buildings have great iron grills bolted over them, and the doors have been strengthened too. Although you usually prefer your own company to that of others, 
you decide to stay in Silverton for the night. You want to find out who or what is troubling the people. And we have a nice, gorgeous picture of a dragon here. It's great. It's interesting that they've split up the prologue like this. That is just weird. As you walk down the main street, a single note from a bell rings out from a tall tower ahead. Then a man shan shouts almost desperately, Nightfall! Nightfall! Everybody indoors! You see people scurrying around with anxious faces and look surprised when they see you. Across the street you see a tavern with the words The Old Toad painted on its signpost. As you enter the tavern, a whisper runs through the locals as they recognise you. Some put down their mugs and stare. You are somewhat surprised, but none come over to you to hear tales of adventure. Walking over to the counter, you ask the old innkeeper for a room and a hot tub, but she ignores you and shuffles over to the great oak door, pushing six large bolts into place. Only then does she turn to you and say quietly, That'll be five copper pieces for the room and one more for the tub in advance, if you please. You reach into a leather pouch on your belt and toss the coins on the counter. She hands you an iron key, but at that very moment there is a loud knocking at the door, followed by a voice shouting, shouting, Open up! Open up! This is Owen Caroliff! The old innkeeper shuffles over to the oak, to the oak door again and slides open the bolts. Then a fat and balding man dressed in rich scarlet robes bursts into the tavern, looking around frantically. He sees you and walks quickly in your direction, huffing and puffing. He is a man certainly not used to haste. You notice great beads of sweat on his forehead in the pale candlelight of a room. As he nears you, he calls out urgently. Stranger, I must speak with you. Please sit down. Well then, let us be seated. When he turns to the innkeeper to snap his fingers for food and drinks, you see that he is obviously of some standing in the town, but his face is full of anguish and sorrow. Being curious, you decide to hear what the man has to say. I presume the innkeeper is bolting up the door again, because clearly they're very concerned about something. He pulls out a chair for you at the table, bidding you to sit down, and the innkeeper bustles in with a tray laden with hot broth, roast goose, and mead. The man in the scarlet robes sits opposite in silence, watching you as you feast, as though examining you for some purpose of his own. Finally, as you push your plate away, the man leans forwards and says, in a low but anxious voice, Stranger, I know of you and seek your name. Seek your aid. My name is Owen Caroliff, and I am Mayor of Silverton. We are in great trouble and danger. We are living under a curse, and it is I who must rid us of it. Ten days ago, two messengers of evil rode into town on huge black stallions. They rode on the backs of the black stallions. Stallions with fierce red eyes! It was impossible to see the faces of the riders, for they wore long black cloaks with hoods pulled over their faces, and they was asking about hobbitses. Oh no, they wasn't. That's a different book. Their voices were cold, and each word spoke and ended with an unnerving hiss. They asked for me by name, and when I came to greet them, they wanted to take my beloved daughter, Mirelle, to stay with their master, Zanbar Bone. No doubt that you know he is the Night Prince. Of course, I refused their demand, and without another word they turned and rode slowly out of town, heads down and shoulders hunched. I knew then that beneath their cloaks were hidden the skeletal and soldiers, soulless bodies of spirit stalkers. Zanbarbone always uses them as his messengers, as they will complete the mission or die in the attempt. And they do not die easily. Only a silver arrow through the heart will release these evil beings from their eternal twilight existence. Who knows what it would take to kill Zambar Bone? Quite a lot, to be honest. That same night, after the spirit stalkers left, our troubles began. The Night Prince was angry and determined to harm us. Six moon dogs came, each stronger than four men, 
each uh, with razor sharp fangs. They stalk through the town, entering homes through open windows and killing poor people inside. And here we have a picture of Zan Barboon himself. In the morning, we counted 23 dead, so we barred our windows and bolted our doors. Yet each night, the moon dogs return, and we are unable to sleep for fear that they might find a way into our homes. Some people are now talking of sending Mirel to Zambar Bone. Those whimpering traitors! I should have them flogged! But what good will that do? Oh, what good indeed! There is but one hope, and that rests on you, stranger. There is a man called Nicodemus who, for reasons I'll never understand, lives in Port Black Sand. The place is commonly called the City of Thieves, as it is the home of every pirate, brigand, assassin, thief and evil doer for hundreds of miles around. I think he lives there just to get some peace from the likes of us. He is a wise old wizard and is unlikely to come to much harm, even in Port Black Sand, for his magical powers are great. He alone is capable of defeating Zambar Bone. He used to be a friend of mine many years ago. We need him, and I beg you to bring him to us. None here dares enter Port Black Sand. So, if you remember Yastromo from the Forest of Doom, Temple of Terror, um, the was it Curse of the Lich? Return of the Lich, Return of Zagor, Zagor's Re Revenge. Um, Yastromo features quite heavily in the Fighting Fantasy series, and he's a great character. But Yastromo and Nicodemus, Yastromo, Nicodemus, and is it Pentaikora for the third one? There are three main wizards in the world of Alancia. Oh, the world of Titan, sorry. Uh, Titan, you got like a land series, a big continent over here. You got the old world over here, and then down here you've got like the Oriental area. I can't remember the name of it. It's not, it's not Rokushima Tayu because that's Ravenloft. It's uh, it's not Rokugan because that's Legend of the Five Rings. Um, it's something else. I should break open my copy of Titan and check this stuff up at some point. Anyway. You will be well rewarded if you help us, stranger. Take these 30 gold pieces for your journey, and take this sword to use and keep. Like, you've killed dragons, but you don't have a weapon of your own, so we're giving you a new one now. Uh, or, or maybe it's just sharp and yours might be a bit rusty and knackered or something or melted down from fighting a dragon. As Owen Carolyph rises, he pulls back his scarlet robe, revealing the finest broadsword you have ever seen. He hands it to you, and touching the edge of the blade, you are surprised to see a droplet of blood fall from your finger. You then examine the marvellously ornate gilded serpents twining around the hilt. You have never wanted anything so badly in your life before. You stand up and hold out your right arm to Owen. He shakes it eagerly, saying, You must set off at the first light of dawn. The moon dogs will be gone by then. I shall be forced to save a night here also. So let us drink to our destiny, and may the gods be with us. For the next hour, Owen talks about your camping journey, explaining in detail how to reach Port Black Sand. Later, you gather up your backpack and furs and climb the wooden stairs to your room. You sleep uneasily, despite the security afforded by your new broadsword, as you are more than once awoken by the sniffing scratching and howling of the roaming moon dogs outside. By dawn, you are already awake and dressed, determined to reach Port Black Sand and find this man, Nicodemus. As you leave the tavern, a black cat scurries past your feet and you almost trip. A bad omen, perhaps. Now, turn over. That guard. That gate guard. So many memories of this pit. Wasn't it Ian Mc something? It's not McAllister. It's, uh... Ah! I'm gonna have to look it up afterwards, but... This helmet almost looks like a proto-Space Marine helmet with this lower portion down here. And the seeming glow within the eyes. I mean, this, this art style 
This art style came to define the fighting fantasy series over many a year. Ah, and it has been remembered fondly. Bloody hell, that sword hilt is really chunky, isn't it? I mean, that. I mean, you want a nice pommel, but this here would be a nightmare to try and grip. But maybe he's just really comfortable with it. I don't know. I do like the details on this spear shaft as well. You got. Is that like a little head of some kind of serpentine creature wrapped around it? You know, carved into it. Well, not carved in, but like embossed or something. You know, it's. It's just ornate. It makes it look important. You know, this this fellow can afford these highly fancy accoutrements. The walk to Port Black Sand takes you west some 50 miles across plains and over hills, fortunately without any harmful encounters. Eventually, you reach the coast and see the high walls surrounding Port Black Sand and the cluster of buildings projecting into the sea like an ugly black mark. Ships lie anchored in the harbour and smoke rises gently from chimneys. It looks peaceful enough and it is only when the wind changes that you smell the decay in the breeze to remind you of the evil nature of this notorious place. Following the dusty road north along the coast to the city gates, you begin to notice fearful warnings. Skulls on wooden spikes, starving men in iron cages suspended from the city wall, and black flags everywhere. That's right, because the lord, the, 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 you know, the ruler of Port Black Sand, used to be a pirate, and in fact he's still an active pirate, he has a pirate ship that occasionally raids vessels that dare to roam too close to the city shore. As you approach the main gate, a chill runs down your spine and you instinctively grip the hilt of your broadsword for reassurance. At the gate you are confronted by a tall guard wearing a black chainmail coat and iron helmet. He steps forward, barring the way with his pike, saying, Who would enter Port Black Sand uninvited? State the nature of your business, or go back the way you came. How will you respond? Tell him you wish to be taken to Nicodemus? Tell him you wish to sell some stolen booty? Or if you wish to attack him, quickly with your sword... Okay, so we're not going to attack the guard. That's just going to lead to no end of trouble. I mean, we could probably kill him and just about get through, but it's a fight we don't need. Tell him we want to go see Nicodemus, he'll probably just laugh at us. Tell him we want to sell some stolen booty, he'll probably say, oh, that's worth money, I want a cut of it, and make us bribe him to get in. So, I could demand to be taken to Nicodemus, but we are playing Hoodman, Skerin. So, we will tell him we want to sell some stolen booty. You tell the guard that you wish to sell some silver chalices that you stole from a tavern in Silverton and that you will pay him a gold piece for his advice as to where to go for the best price. The guard looks at you suspiciously saying, Let me have a look at these chalices in that backpack before I admit you. What will you do? Tell him that you know the chalices are cursed and should only be examined by a mage. Or run past the guard into the main street that might not work attack him. Yeah, we're going to tell him they're cursed. The guard frowns and says, Ah, oh, likely story, I'm sure, but I suppose you're just the same as the rest in the city. You may enter at your own peril, or buy my advice for free gold pieces. You know, it's been donkey's years since I last played this, so sure. This city is ruled by Lord Azur, and he is a cruel man. When you preside over the chaotic inhabitants of Port Black Sand, you have to be mean. And he's the meanest. I should warn you that if you are found without a pass, you are as good as dead. I would get one if I were you, pretty quickly. He then makes a sweeping gesture of his arm, and you walk past him into the city. And the opportunity to get a pass is nowhere near the main gate. Through the main gates, you see that the rubbish-filled streets of the port are narrow and cobbled. Sorry, I was just going to call them the rubbish streets. No, the rubbish-filled streets of the port are narrow and cobbled. 
Old and decrepit buildings live, line them closely with their upper stories overhanging menacingly. We can go west down Key Street or north along Market Street or east down Clock Street. You know what would be really nice? If the developers took the old map support Black Sand from Titan and um, the Advanced Fighting Fantasy series and used those or even the the map from the start of this book and use that, you know, because it, it was a really good map. Okay. Um, I'm trying to remember how to... Well, that's not it. We want to go back into City of Thieves. I couldn't find the key to put the map away, so we'll go... Right. I seem to remember Key Street is a goodish one, but we'll go along Market Street. Walking north along the street, you see the entrance to a small herbalist shop on your left. Walk, looking through the window, you see a wooden counter with a pair of scales on it, and many sacks of different herbs crowding the floor. There is a small archway leading out of the back of the shop to another room. There is an open sign on the door, but the shop is empty. Well, let's stroll inside anyway, because if we get found on the streets and arrested, we are not in good shape. Aha! He is an unusual looking fellow. He's got an axe there behind the counter. He's got pointed ears. A bit bloated looking. This looks like... Is that... Uh, that sax? For a moment it looked like the edge of a shirt and a ridiculously muscled arm, but it's sax. We have some things, you know, prices on. Yeah. Actually, I'm not sure this... Hmm. A small bell rings as the door opens, and a creature wearing a brown apron over his clothing hurries through the archway from the back room into the shop to stand behind the counter. He appears human-like, but has very ugly facial features and pointed teeth. You realise he is a crossbreed, half man, half orc. A sharp axe hangs from his belt to remind you that Port Black Sand is unlikely to be a friendly place in which to do business. What would you like to do? To inquire about the range of herbs? Ask if he knows of Nicodemus. Or attack the man orc. No, we'll just ask if he knows of Nicodemus. The man orc tells you that for one gold piece he'll tell you all he knows. Well, we shall absolutely pay him. The man orc takes your gold piece and spins it in the air with a flick of the thumb, catching it in the ape pocket of his apron. He then starts to pick his teeth with a sharpened twig and finally says, I know nothing about him. You know, we could fight him for his impudence, or just leave. Yeah, let's just leave. Um, it's not like uh, we couldn't defeat him, but we only have so much health to go around. And we don't want to take unnecessary risks. On the right-hand side of the street, you see a small tavern called the Spotted Dog. You know, let's go take a look inside the spotted dog. Hey, now, here's a familiar picture. we got the barman there behind the bar with a filthy rag cleaning a mug. we got this creature. Is he some kind of cat creature with a big, like, uh, sort of... It's not like a walrus moustache, but kind of like, um... Oh... Is it hamster cheeks? Is it hamsters or the other ones that store food in their cheeks? And pointed ears, we got this dwarf here drinking away heavily. And this man playing a game with a dagger between his fingers. He's got an eye patch on. The old wooden doors open into a dingy smoke-filled room. There are eight round tables in the centre of the room with some of the most mean and shifty looking rogues you have ever seen sitting at them. At the back of the tavern is a long wooden bar, covered in bottles and mugs. Behind the bar stands the innkeeper, wearing a grubby apron. He is quite old, bald, and has an ugly black scar running down his right cheek, which we can't see because it's turned away from us. What would you like to do? Walk to the bar and talk with the innkeeper? Join a table with three dwarfs who are playing a dice game. 
sit down at a table with two goblins who are arguing, sit down with three men who are sticking daggers quickly between their fingers on the table, or leave the tavern. Well, you know what I think I will do? I think looking at the time, I will end this episode here and pick it up in the next one. Uh, I know that we suffered an early unfortunate fate in Island of the Lizard King, but even so, I hope you've all enjoyed this episode and I'll look forward to seeing you all in the next one. I'll say bye-bye for now and cheerio!